In this lecture, um, I'm going to talk about um, sport and semantics, <clears throat> or in other words, uh, where do words come from? And um, I'm going to look at um, sports nicknames, and I'm going to look at the um, some of the origins of team names. So the study of um, words and where they come from is called um, etymology. <clears throat> and um, that particular word um, comes from two words. Um, the wor word uh, in Greek, etymon, meaning the true sense, um, and the suffix, of course, logia, which means the study of. <clears throat> now, um, it's a little misleading to uh, think of um, uh, etymology as being the study of the true sense of words, uh, because words change. Um, so that particular <clears throat> word in Greek, um, although it may mean the true sense, really now means the, the origin and the derivation. And it also tell, uh, speaks to how words change over time. So for example, if we look at the word soccer <clears throat> and look at the etymology of soccer, um, uh, this is um, uh, a study by Szymanski who has argued that um, um, the word soccer, which um, these days uh, is used, uh, not used at all in Britain, was in fact used in Britain until relatively recently. And perhaps it's only because of the rise in terms of soccer in the United States that the, the English, the Brits, have decided to try and um, separate themselves from American soccer by <clears throat> insisting on the use of the word football. Um, Szymanski notes that um, <clears throat> um, the, the derivation of the word soccer is very similar to the derivation of the word rugger. Um, so um, this all comes from the actual codification of the, the game of football into the rules of association football, which we know as soccer, and the <clears throat> uh, codification of the rules of rugby. Um, so at that time, once we started talking about rugby football, uh, then a word was derived from that, an abbreviation in a sense, with the E-R suffix into rugger. And um, the argument being that soccer has a similar derivation coming from the association uh, part of that particular um, association of football. So we have the word soccer. <clears throat> um, so countries that tend to use soccer uh, nowadays, like Australia, and the, and the nickname of the Australian um, soccer team is the other is the Socceroos. Um, so Australia, USA, for example, usually have another sport called football. So we talk about we talk about football in the United States. Of course, we're referring to the uh, the National Football League, that type of football. <clears throat> um, but it seems as though soccer was was the accepted term in Britain um, until quite recently, at least until the um, first half of the um, 20th century, throughout the first half of the, uh, the 20th century. And it's only recently, um, uh, Szymanski argues, that uh, in the 1980s, in fact, that uh, the Brits began to exclusively use the word football. So words become important in uh, the sense that the word you use distinguishes a, a group of people from another group who use a different word. Okay, so let's have a look at um, nicknames and team names and have a look at where they come from. Um, so let's have a look at nicknames to begin with. And this is a study by Canada, Kennedy and Zamuna. And they um, uh, looked at the um, uh, nicknames uh, in sport. Um, and they looked at mainly um, uh, football and ice hockey and baseball. So a nickname is a referring expression that identifies an individual and that differs from the formal given names of the referent. So we all have a given name and usually we have some kind of nickname. And in fact, we might have several nicknames. Um, Kennedy and Zamuna distinguish between two types of nicknames, what they call firstly the Homeric nickname. And this is usually created by fans in the media and it's for reference. Uh, you don't address a person directly with a Homeric uh, nickname. Rather, it's used by fans, media, to uh, refer to a particular athlete. Um, it's Homeric in the sense that um, um, if you read um, the works of Homer and the Iliad 
in the Odyssey, then um, you often get references to the kinds of qualities that particular characters, personalities have. So um, uh, uh, Homer would write, for example, um, swift-footed Achilles. And that's the equivalent of a nickname in sport, like the Sultan of Swat, which is a nickname of the uh, baseball player Babe Ruth. Um, they talk about certain ways that these Homeric nicknames um, can come into existence. For example, wordplay. Steve Buzinski, um, the put goes Insky, uh, imagery, um, the E-Train for Eric Lindros, um, personal traits or associations. So Clint Albright is known as the professor. And then, of course, toponyms. Where do these particular athletes come from? So Pavel Bure uh, becomes the Russian rocket. Um, clearly, he's from Russia. Um, and here's some uh, famous examples of Homeric nicknames. Um, uh, Motormouth, the Duke of Trilly, the Iron Horse, the Wild Elk of the Wasatch. Wow. Mr. October, um, our Spaceman suitcase, um, the Arkansas hummingbird. And so these are um, speak to the kinds of things we just talked about before, where uh, an athlete comes from, their particular um, talent or gifts, uh, and they become um, these kinds of very large uh, nicknames, which fans use, sports writers would use, but you wouldn't go up to the person and say, hey, uh, uh, Motormouth or the Wild Elk of Wasatch. So they are not address terms. Uh, nicknames, as we perhaps more commonly know them as, uh, rather than, uh, to give it the fancy name, they're called hypocharistic nicknames, to distinguish them from Homeric nicknames. And these are usually relatively short, one or two syllables derived from the first or second name for reference and addressed by fans and other players. Um, uh, I've given you some uh, examples of um, uh, family names there, and you might want to pause and see what kind of nicknames you can make out of those family names. Um, well, here's a little bit of data. Um, I gave those nicknames to a uh, group of students, and uh, uh, the nickname on the, uh, on the right there are the kinds of nicknames they came up with. So what you begin to notice um, is that one of the most um, uh, uh, common ways of creating a nickname is to uh, uh, use um, uh, what's called truncation or clipping, uh, reducing the, uh, the two or three syllable word into just one syllable. So if you look at Alvarado, then you get things like um, Alves, um, for example, or Rado, um, or even Alley. Uh, well, it's two syllables. Um, you probably see it better with things like um, Cheney um, becomes uh, Chan, Chain, Chains. Um, the times two there means that more than t uh, the two people uh, created that particular um, nickname, so it makes it more common. Or even chorus, down to core, or core, or cores, um, or ris, for example. So that's a pretty common way of creating nicknames. Um, the other one you can see there, of course, is wordplay. Uh, with Alvarado, you've got um, uh, avocado and desperado. Uh, with cannon, you've got boom boom, um, ballsy. Okay. So you can begin to see that there are particular linguistic processes that we all use, and these tend to be, of course, um, linguistically, culturally derived, through, through, through which we create these particular um, hypercharistic nicknames. Um, so we can talk about um, uh, two processes there. Uh, the first one called derivation, and as I said, this involves truncation or clipping of two or more syllable uh, name to one syllable, so Hollister becomes Hall. Um, it can also be made into two syllables uh, with a suffix like um, uh, I, I, E, Y, A, or S. For example, Hall becomes Holly, uh, or Holly, or Holla, or Halls. And then we have the example of wordplay where uh, Canon becomes Boom Boom. Um, Kennedy and Zamuna very nicely create what they uh, what they call a nickname buffer, and it's an example of it's trying to capture how we the process by which we arrive at particular nicknames. 
So on the left there, if you take the formal name, and then uh, if you go through derivation and wordplay, then you arrive at a particular hypercharistic nickname. Okay. Um, from the other side, if you take the personal traits, they feed in and you can create a Homeric uh, nickname uh, or even a hypercharistic uh, uh, um, nickname too. Um, there are other kinds of um, uh, uh, nicknames, well actually not nicknames, but they use perhaps in sports writing, um, a substitute a noun phrase for example. So if you look at the example there, uh, Chara's All-Star season ended with a disappointing subpar playoff, although the big Slovakian did finally resemble his former self with a physical uh, um, former self. So the big Slovakian, of course, is the same as Chara. So it's a substitute uh, NP. Uh, there are also heavy MPs. If you remember the lecture on um, uh, sports, an sports announcer talk, we talked of the way that these heavy MPs can be used. David Winfield, the $25 million man, and that's a heavy MP there. Um, notice how sometimes the, uh, the, the Homeric nickname can actually go through this buffer and uh, then go into derivation and uh, 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 can be truncated. Um, here's an example of that. Uh, first one, um, this is the Canadian ice hockey uh, um, player, um, uh, Claude Lemieux. Um, so um, his particular nickname is Pepe. So um, the Lemieux is uh, as a similarity to the cartoon character, uh, the French cartoon character Pepe Le Pew, which gets to Pepe, and then, okay, it's derived to uh, Pep. So uh, firstly, it becomes Homeric, having the qualities of Pepe Le Pew, and then Pepe is a hypercharistic uh, nickname, which is shortened to Pep. Um, here's an example from a student. Uh, his particular Homeric nickname was uh, Jeff Van Halen. So his name's Halen. He becomes Jeff Van Halen. He's likened to the guitar hero, Eddie Van Halen. And then a hypercharistic um, uh, nickname is derived from that um, through truncation, and he's called Van. Um, another study about nicknames uh, is uh, by Abel, who looked at the names of um, female fighters, female boxers. And uh, what he came up with is uh, a, he broke down the nicknames into um, these particular classifications, biographical, uh, combativeness, uh, femininity, and then he had some uh, miscellaneous and indeterminate uh, categories. Um, most, uh, uh, well, let's look at biographical first. And so he broke that down into place names, ethnicity, uh, past current professions, and um, what he called internal nicknames, which are kind of a bit like um, wordplay based upon the name. So um, a place name, of course, Jane Crouch becomes the Fleetwood Assassin. Uh, Rita Fuguero uh, becomes La Guerra, which is playing on her particular ethnicity. Um, Kathy Williams becomes Shake Em Down. I'm not quite clear what that profession was, but uh, um, maybe some kind of uh, um, uh, trickster. Uh, I don't know what that is. And internal nicknames, uh, Melissa Saint Vale becomes Guard Your Grill. Uh, most of them are, are based on combativeness. Um, so we can break those down into things like attitude, demeanor. Uh, Stephanie Dobbs becomes Spitfire, Warriors, uh, La Viking, boxing skills, La Torreira, uh, hitting power and strength, um, fists of fury, um, explosives and weapons, bomb, weather, lightning, and animals and insects, of course, which is a very common one, the cobra. Uh, just as um, uh, popular as combativeness is the notion of femininity. And uh, one thing this study uh, found was that female boxers, boxers like to maintain the notion of femininity. Um, so um, lots of categories here, general appearance, sexuality, Holly Holm, Hottie, our feline nicknames, uh, Siberian tigress, um, and um, parentage and family. Um, uh, Lila Ali, and she is the daughter of uh, Muhammad Ali, she be stingin', which is a reference to one of his particular um, sayings, um, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Um, so um, 
just about the, the, the bulk of the nicknames either drew on the notion of combativeness uh, or drew on the notion of femininity. And um, it's interesting to note that, especially in a, a field like boxing, it, it, these female boxers felt the, ne uh, the importance of maintaining the, 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 the gender, of identifying the gender of the particular fighter and maintaining the, <clears throat> them as figures of femininity. Uh, if we look a little broader at nicknames, um, what we do find, of course, is that um, nicknames often are associated with particular uh, class or ethnic or cultural groups. Um, this is um, Henry Louis Gates, uh, the professor of African American Studies at Harvard University, and well known for his particular TV shows. Um, are, and he's um, talking about his nickname, Skip. My mom, God rest her soul, he said, she liked nicknames. In the womb, she named me Skip. There was another black guy in Piedmont, West Virginia, and his name was Skip. They called him Big Skip, and I was Little Skip. Um, so the problem was, of course, Henry Louis Gates didn't realize that, of course, that Skip, for a lot of people, sounds a very waspy name. And so he continues in this interview, and he says, hey, you know, I don't think we knew what a wasp was. I didn't realize it until I went to Yale as a student and I met Chip and Muffy and actually, uh, and lots of Skips of course, and of course before he got there he thought Skip was actually a black name. In fact, it's probably a name that's very much associated with uh, 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 wasps and especially wasps, wealthy wasps at Harvard and Yale. Um, an interesting study by the Australian um, linguist uh, uh, Visbeka um, uh, looked at the, the, the tendency in Australian nicknames to create these um, monosyllabic uh, uh, nicknames um, derived from the first name, often ending with uh, a Z. So in Australia, a Mary is um, truncated or clipped to Mars. Barry to Baz, Terry to Tez, Gary to Gaz, Caroline to, or Kathleen or Catherine to Kaz, etc. Uh, what um, uh, what um, um, Bisbika um, argues is that um, um, the, the particular choice of nicknames in Australia says uh, quite a bit about um, Australian culture. She makes the distinction uh, between um, standard English abbreviations for names, affectionate diminutives, and affectionate abbreviations. So for example, Bob or Pam is a pretty standard English abbreviation um, for a, a full name, and that's used across the board in, in whatever um, particular type of English that is spoken. Um, another kind which tends to be uh, uh, across the board, a pan-English uh, phenomenon, is the use of a diminutive. So. A diminutive would be something like Pammy, or from Kathleen would be Kathleeny. Um, and these tend to be um, uh, affectionate terms, terms used by parents, uh, often when uh, the, the, to the, about their children, when, especially when they were children. And they mostly end, of course, in a vowel. Um, the distinction that she found with Australian abbreviations is there was this, th this third group uh, which she called anti-diminutives, um, which suggest a particular toughness. Um, they use between peers, but they actually are trying to uh, uh, mark out a certain um, uh, affectionate anti-sentimentality. Um, and they mostly end in consonants, as we've seen, like Baz, like Baz uh, Thorman, uh, they're the director of The Great Gatsby and other uh, movies. Of course, um, you can have multiple nicknames, and these can um, uh, uh, depend upon on, uh, different relationships. So have a look at this little conversation. So A says, how was your trip to Reykjavik, Ronnie? And B says, I think it well went, went well, Mummy. At least everyone kept saying, Dutch, you've changed the world. So um, B is has two nicknames there, Ronnie and Dutch. 
and A has one nickname, which is Mommy. Um, who are the people involved here? Well, it's Nancy Reagan. A is Nancy Reagan, and B is Ronald Reagan. So Nancy Reagan's nickname for Ronald Reagan was Ronnie, and his nickname for her was Mommy. Uh, Ronald Reagan also had another nickname he, that was used with his, uh, his uh, colleagues, uh, which was Dutch. Okay. And that's a reference to the, the famous uh, meeting in uh, Reykjavik uh, uh, with um, Gorbachev. Okay, so let's have a quick look at um, team names. Um, this is a study, and it's a rather old study, um, and are uh, ooh, over 40 years now, by Kinlock. And Kinlock had a look at the uh, names of um, football teams. Uh, in the uh, NFL. And he came up with these categories, uh, patriotism, local patriotism and industry, romanticized cultural tradition, animalism, and military and chivalric qualities, and finally modern technology. And so he sorted his particular teams into these categories. So uh, clearly uh, the most, uh, uh, and perhaps the only one fully patriotic particular uh, name is New England Patriots. Um, and then in terms of local patriotism and industry, he looked at teams that celebrated the particular main occupations of those particular cities. So Pittsburgh Steelers, Houston Oilers, and Green Bay Packers, for example. Um, the, the category of romanticized, cult, romanticized cultural tradition is, was, is an attempt to uh, associate a team with a particular romantic view of that particular area. So um, Kansas City Chief celebrates uh, the, the fact that this was a very large area uh, for Native American tribes, uh, was, uh, no more. And similarly, uh, Dallas Cowboys celebrates the, the romanticized view of uh, Texas and cowboys, although you probably wouldn't find many cowboys in Dallas. Animalism is the biggest category. Um, Detroit Lions, Chicago Bears, Cincinnati Bengals, Atlanta Falcons, Los Angeles Rams, and there's several more. And then we have military and chivalric qualities, and this is suggested by words like the Raiders, the Chargers, and the Giants. And there seemed to be only one particular name that referred to modern technology, and that was the New York Jets. Um, that was 1973, and since then, if you look at some of the expansion teams, you can begin to sort these into these categories. Uh, Seattle Seahawks, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Buccaneers, I guess, would go in the military and chivalric qualities. Car Carolina Panthers, Jacksonville Jaguars, Baltimore Ravens all go into the, um, into the um, uh, animal category. Um, and then uh, what about Tennessee Titans and Houston Texans? Okay. Um, Houston Texans could perhaps go into the romanticized cultural tradition, the notion of being a Texan. Or would it, be, would it go into the patriotism uh, particular uh, category? One of the problems, of course, is often they overlap. But what's interesting is to, to look at how, how these categories, the way we name things in the, in the world, um, create patterns, cultural patterns, that we identify with and, and continue. And also, interesting to see how they change as well. So one interesting thing would be to look at, say, all the new teams in the MLS uh, and see how uh, uh, those particular team names uh, differ from uh, these particular uh, categories in the NFL. Um, finally, um, a study about German team names, uh, which seeks to kind of break down um, the very formulaic way in which uh, uh, the names of soccer teams in Germany are put together. So this is a study by um, 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 Hess Lichtenberger um, from a really fascinating book about German football called Tor. Um, uh, and um, firstly, he begins by looking at those little um, letters at the end of the uh, word there, EV, uh, as you can see, FC Bayern Munchen 1900 EV. Um, and EV just refers to a registered club. It's a kind of like limited uh, uh, LTD um, company, co. Uh, then you've got the date of the club's formation. As you can see, 
uh, uh, Munich were, were started in 1900, and uh, Dortmund was started in 1909. Then we got the name of the city, uh, München or Munich, and then Dortmund. And then before that, we usually have some flowery name, often of Roman origin, reflecting local patriotism. So Borussia is the actual um, uh, Latin word for um, Prussia. And uh, Bayern is, is a local name for um, uh, Bavaria. And then um, at the beginning of the, um, of the name, we have things like FC. FC, of course, is clearly football club. But what about BV? Um, well, V in German means Verein, which means club. And often these particular soccer teams started as general uh, sports clubs, and then they gradually developed into soccer teams. So... Um, um, Verein, uh, BV would be uh, um, a club uh, in which several sports were, were um, played. Uh, T, if you notice there, refers to gymnastics. And so you can look at um, this particular club, um, uh, TSV, uh, uh, Bayer um, 04 Leverkusen. So if we unpack that, um, what we'll see is this: this began as a um, gymnastics club. It started in 1904, and um, the name of the city is um, uh, is um, the name of the area is Leverkusen, or the name of the city. Uh, but we also have something of an anomaly here. Have a look at that word Bayer. Uh, that remind you of something? Yeah. Well, it's the um, chemical industry, uh, which um, uh, the, was the origin of the name of this um, team. So the workers at this particular Bayer. Uh, um, factory uh, wanted to create a soccer team so they named themselves after the industry which is kind of un unusual in German um, <clears throat> in German club names okay so what we've done is just looked at some of the ways in which nicknames and team names uh, are formed and, and as you can see we see certain patterns which tend to be imitated uh, across the board so we do get a pattern to the particular naming of uh, clubs, uh, of soccer teams, and we also get a pattern to the, the way that nicknames are derived.